Yakuza, known now more realistically as Yakuza 1 or Yakuza and then in brackets PS2, was the very first game of the Yakuza slash Like a Dragon series. Released on the PS2 back in 2005 in Japan or 2006 everywhere else, this game saw one single re-release being a Japanese exclusive HD version of this game and its sequel Yakuza 2 on the PS3 in 2012 and the Wii U in 2013. It also ended up seeing a remake known as Yakuza Kiwami which is a game that I will discuss later in this little video series I'll be doing. In this in this series I'll be looking at each game in the now Like a Dragon franchise including spin-offs and discussing a bit of their history and significance. Now then with each video I was going to mention features that got added to each game such as later games having the camera you can use to take photos but considering this was the very first one I guess you could say that every feature in this one was introduced in this one so that's a lot of features. Nah but in all seriousness the gameplay of this game plays exactly like every other game in the series with your core mechanics of light attack combos and combo finishes, heat actions, grabs, weapons you can pick up off the floor and and so on. Being their first dive into the games, this one is quite obviously missing a lot of the small things that the developers ended up adding over the almost two decade long run of the franchise. Big thing that this game lacks is the ability to properly control the camera. Outside of combat, the camera is stuck looking at fixed camera angles, and in combat, the camera can only be readjusted by pressing a button to wrap it behind you, or you just kind of hope that the camera doesn't just move around into a horrible position, because it likes to do that sometimes. To be fair though, at the time of making the game, there hadn't been two 3D games made almost a decade prior that set the groundwork for how to control a camera in a 3D space or anything, you know. The fixed camera outside of combat was for a fairly reasonable reason, however. That being that the world was quite detailed with lots of NPCs wandering around here and there, so it ends up saving on resources a little bit. Obviously though, fighting in the same spaces with the camera behind you might make you think that it could have been possible for the camera to be like it is in future games, but if the camera was like it is in the future games, what probably would have happened is that there still would have been constant loading zones like there already were, but instead it just looks like the game lags. Although what resources the PS2 would be consuming for this game I honestly don't know because to be quite honest it looks like shit 90% of the time. And while many people try to defend the game from that blatantly obvious fact by saying that well it was only the PS2 cut them some slack, I fully understand. Once again it's not like there was a PS2 game released over 4 years prior that looked 100,000 times better or anything. The PS2 defense is irrelevant because the actual thing you have to consider when looking at the visuals of this game is that the game was actually made with a budget of $12 and a ham and cheese sandwich from 7-Eleven. However due to the fact that 7-Eleven food in Japan actually goes hard, the creators of the game had stoked a fire within them and thus they created a game that had an incredibly detailed and realistic version of the streets of Kabukicho, the city that the fictional place of Kamurocho was based off of. Sure, every model was a single polygon and every texture was 4 pixels, but the posters, billboards, signs, lights, people, everything about the city feels quite real. This was coupled with the focused world design. The map was much smaller than something like GTA San Andreas, but it allowed for more precision of detail and meant that there was lots of stuff to look at and interact with. Alongside the world was the incredibly fun beat em up style combat where you just absolutely smash the shit out of people that try to fight you with so many different heat actions, weapons at your disposal, all of which take into context many things such as where you or the enemy is standing, what you've got in your hands, or even what you're doing with your own hands. Overall the game was fun and even still to this day there's nothing really like it besides obviously the other games in the very same series. But gameplay is not all, and that's because the story is definitely another selling point of the franchise. Clearly inspired by film and television that would tell a realistic story, the writers didn't want to pull any punches, and they ended up going all out and telling a story that they wanted to tell for this brand new game. These days, we have stuff like The Last of Us, for example, that tell a very brutal and grounded story, but back then there weren't too many realistic games, especially not from Sega, who obviously makes stuff like Sonic, and especially, especially, not even from the guys at Sega, directly responsible for this game, because they were, and still are, the ones that make the Super Monkey Ball games. So yeah, it was a bit odd at the time, but definitely an ambition that was welcome amongst a lot of people. The game in its original version had the Japanese dub, but in the English version they had an English dub, which was quite offensive, both in how they say a few offensive words you're not allowed to say anymore, but also because it sucked. Anyway, with this video series I don't ever want to dive into an analysis of the stories as I don't really want to spoil anything, but instead I'll give you an overview of some of the things that are important. This game, as you probably could guess, was the most significant story in the franchise, and yes that's because it was the first one that established everything, but also it's because it's the game where its events directly affected future titles more so than any of the other ones. A big example of that are the relationships that the protagonist Kiryu makes throughout the story. His relationship with those affiliated with his Yakuza clan, the Tojo clan, as well as a couple of other characters were all established off screen. But then the most important relationships he created were with Date, essentially Kiryu's life partner at this point, and his basically adopted daughter Haruka. That means then that this game doesn't have the annoying trend that future games establish where characters that you like that actually survive the events of the game 
are never to be seen again. Instead, your boy Date has been in almost as many games as Kiryu himself, and good thing that he does, because literally, who doesn't like Date? However, the game does suffer from the lazy writer's trope of killing characters just for shits and giggles, which honestly the franchise does a lot, but in the first game, it was especially bad. It's a bit of a side effect of popular media back in the early 2000s, where Edge was cool, and so the writers thought that they were really cooking when they killed like seven important characters. The idea you might get is that it adds weight to the drama by ending someone's life so suddenly, but instead, it's essentially just the writer saying, ah, I can't be fuck around this character anymore. There's also the main emotional drive of the plot being that Kiri has been betrayed by his closest friend, Nishiki. However, in the first game, you literally get to spend, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, about 110 seconds or 1 minute 50 being mates with Nishiki, then you spend about 100 seconds or 1 minute 40 yelling at Nishiki because he does something dumb. So in total, you spend 3 minutes and 30 seconds with Nishiki before he betrays you, so I don't know about anyone else, but I wouldn't care about him at all. That being said though, the cinematic direction was still very good, even if things like the cutscene animation were immediately outclassed by the sequel to this game. So even when the story does dumb shit, you still always want to know what happens next. Then finally, the game's soundtrack set a standard of quality that is to be expected from the music of these games. Part of that standard is how it had a decent bit of variation amongst the songs, which is a big thing with the franchise. A lot of the songs too ended up getting rearranged in the Kiwami remake, as well as a few of the songs from the first game getting remixes and what have you in later games, such as stuff like Receive You, basically the main theme of the game. While you can't just jump onto something like Steam and buy the game, you can jump onto Spotify and give the music a listen. And then there's not too much else to say about it besides that, you know, it's pretty good. Now then, on to the final thing I want to discuss. Unfortunately, within the community for these games, there is a constant argument over which game is better, which realistically began right after the sequel to this was released. But I'm sure it was a much more civil discussion back then compared to how it is now, considering that there were only two games in the franchise, and only a total of two people that had played them. The reason I bring this up though is because people disagree with one another on whether or not you should play the original PS2 version of this game, or if you should play the Kiwami remake. And to that, I say this. When it comes to opinions and personal taste, there is never a correct answer. The closest you get to what might be the, let's say, most correct answer is whichever opinion is the general consensus. And by that I mean the opinions that a majority of people might share. For example, the general consensus on which is the best cola soft drink, or soda, is that Coke is better than Pepsi. I'm definitely a Coke guy, and looking at my desk, I literally have a Coke right here right now. I'm going to take a sip. So you can definitely say I'm on that side, but I do love a cheeky bit of Pepsi Max. I will gladly drink it, which means that I have gone against the grain and disagreed with a majority of people. But what this example shows is that I can be on the side of the majority, but maybe I might prefer to be in the minority, or in my case, I'm basically on both sides of the argument. This same situation can be applied to the first Yakuza game. The game more people have played is Kiwami. It's very understandable because Kiwami is available on PS3, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series S, and Xbox Series X, as well as PC, whereas the original is only available on PS2, PS3 in Japan, Wii U in Japan, and technically PC if you play it via emulation, but that's kind of illegal. Uh, hey Sega, I promise you that this is a legit PS3 version, which I do actually own by the way, but I definitely haven't been playing it emulated because it's easier for me to record. And so it's pretty clear to see that the objective general consensus on which is the better choice is Kiwami 1 for being the most accessible. But when it comes to a more subjective opinion, well, that's where results may change. But if more people prefer Kiwami over the PS2 game, does that mean you're not allowed to like it? No, not at all. Can you enjoy both? Yeah, of course you can. I like almost all of the games in this franchise. And finally, can you still enjoy Kiwami despite the fact that you constantly get people telling you in your comments section that you should play the PS2 games, even though I have... Stop telling me to play the PS2 games. I've played them already. Anyway, moral of the story is one game is not automatically a replacement for the other. They're both very different games with the only similarities being in the main story and some sub stories that were recreated. If you're concerned that your experience might be ruined because you've already experienced the story, just think of how many games you might have done multiple playthroughs of. I mean, the story sucks cock anyway, so just go play whatever bloody games you want. You're not going to get shot by picking the wrong option. There is no wrong option. I would highly recommend that people trying to get into the franchise should 100% go with the current modern releases, because at least if you don't like it, you can just refund it or some shit. But imagine going through all the effort to play the PS2 version, find out you don't like it, and then you're just sitting there pissed off, you wasted your time trying to play it instead of an actually good game like Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. Although, if you are a fan of the franchise and want to experience as much of it as you can, then the PS2 games are definitely an interesting experience. It's always nice to look back at the roots of things, like how I started off playing the Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon games back when I was a kid, but I still enjoy looking at how far the series has come. But then, simultaneously, if you can't be bothered playing whichever other version of the game you didn't play, 
go right ahead and not play it. Enjoy whatever you want to enjoy, not what you're told to enjoy. Anyway, to summarize the video, Yakuza 1 on the PS2 is still pretty nice. It was a good first go for them and laid the foundations for all the future games to follow in order to create a very fun video game franchise. However, Kingdom Hearts 2 came out two weeks after this game did in Japan, so I mean, you know. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, feel free to set a fixed camera angle with your eyes on that cheeky subscribe button or the other button in the description so you can become a member. Maybe. Anyway, I hope you look forward to the next video in this little series, which will feature the sequel to Yakuza 1, being of course, Yakuza 2.